if you've been watching this channel for a while, you know I am doing the 100 day project. And my project for the 100 days is to hand dye paper. Now I've started from where I was, I like that quote, start from where you are, and I've got a lot of dyes left over from my yarn dyeing days. And I thought I'm going to use those. I already knew they dyed paper because I used to test my colours on strips of watercolour paper. So I wanted to really get into this and see all the different effects I can produce and do it in a way that suits me. That was a quick flip through of days one to five and I've actually collected one sheet of each of those and clip them together as a potential signature. So I'm just going to put those on one side. And then we're just going through the next day. This is day six and so on. And I've been trying things out. My first 10 days of dyeing have just been purely exploration, trying out different colors. I haven't really tried out many different papers. I've used copy paper in two different weights. So 100 GSM and 80 GSM. And I've tried watercolor paper, which I'll show you in a minute. I've also tried to get lots of texture and marks into the paper while I've been dyeing. <laughs> My new best friend is corrugated cardboard. It's fantastic. I've been using speckling and splattering. I've been making marks with bubble wrap, adding those when the paper's dry, and so on and so on. I'm just going to leave that there so I know which day it is. And I really love some of these papers. I mean, I actually like them all, but I absolutely love some of them. I think the different effects and that could be, you know, in a sea theme journal or a mermaid theme journal or something like that. Absolutely lovely. And <laughs> my latest dye session with Ordinary Paper, I actually managed to get some imprints of flowers. So I was really pleased about that. I've separated those out as well because I think they might be going into the signature. I'm, I'm missing one. I'll have to go back and find it. But I should have nine and I've got eight. Yesterday, day 10, I decided to branch out a bit and do some watercolour paper. This is really cheap watercolour paper from the works in the UK from a pad. And it's almost A3. When the paper has still got the perforations on it, I think it is A3. But when you tear those off, it's slightly smaller. But it dyes really well and it has a nice feel to it. It feels very flexible. It doesn't go crinkly and brittle like the copy paper. And I love the fact that I've got these different sides that are vastly different. They couldn't be more different, could they? It's quite easy to do that. This one, oh, in love with the corrugated cardboard again. Uh, more different colours on the other side and so on. I think any of these watercolour papers would make wonderful journal covers. And this looks really rusty, doesn't it? It's not rust, it's just dye. I've just done it with my dyes. Now you have seen the video on Thursday when I made a master board and I made it from one of these papers. It was one of my earlier day trials with this paper and I decided not to mix the papers after that because I just loaded far too much dye onto one side and ended up something that I thought was not usable. But actually, if you look back at the last video, it was perfect for making a master board. For the first 10 days of the project, I did a short dyeing session each day, mixed some different colours, just experimented with what I felt like on that particular day. And each session was maybe about 20 minutes. And then I dried the papers overnight and looked at them in the daylight the next morning and that sort of got me thinking about what I would do 
in the next day's dye session. But after doing that for 10 days, I think I need a longer review and a reflect so that I can decide how I'm going to move forward and what I'm going to do next and pinpoint specific experiments that I want to do. I also want to plan to use some of the papers. I don't think there's any point in doing a 100 days of dyeing paper if I haven't actually done anything with the paper. And I really enjoyed doing that masterboard. And I want to do some more things with the paper that I've already dyed. And I think it will be a really good idea to do some recording of what I've done in a little journal, which I've got here. I've got another of those little journals. And I'm going to have a proper think and a plan. And in the next few days, I'm going to see what I can produce. Tags, journaling cards, signatures, those kinds of things. I'm going to use my hand-dyed paper to make some ephemera. Now, I won't be doing videos for all of those, but I will be posting all of my pictures onto Instagram. One thing I've realised is that it's not sustainable for me to do some sort of video, even a reel every day, because it just takes so much time. So I'm going to take some pictures and I'm going to do a multi-picture post and a story from that. So that if you're interested in following along, you can do. And on my Art Paper Joy Instagram account, I'm actually, I think I've kept up so far, whatever I post about that day's dying, I do it as a post, I do it as a story, and then I'm saving all of the stories into a highlight. So by the end of the 100 days, I should have 100 posts in that highlight. And no one else may be interested in that. But for me, it will be absolutely invaluable. And just going back to my video that I did on my other channel, Craftanoon Treats, about Instagram, that's, the, I think, the key to enjoying these social media platforms. And that is to use them in the way that you want. Don't do it for the number of likes you get or the number of followers, but do it in such a way that it's your own visual diary. And that's what I'm doing with those stories. What I'm doing for each day is taking a couple of strips of the hand dyed paper from that session. And then I'm recording the paper I've used, the method, the dye colour and any notes and observations that I'm making. So I'm being very scientific, aren't I? And one of the most important things I've realised with hand-dyed paper is when you tear it, you don't get any white edges. The dye is absolutely all the way through the paper. And I don't know what happens on paper that's different colours, one side and the other, whether it meets in the middle, but there's definitely no white paper left. So that's interesting. That makes it really good for tearing up for collage because you don't need to ink it up if you don't like white edges. I've done this for each of the days. I even did a little bit of, see if I can get some uh, leaf embossing in there like I did for the Defema Ember Journal. And I did get a reasonably good leaf print there. That's, I can't remember what plant it is. I think it's the last of the geranium leaves, although it doesn't look like a geranium. That's definitely a eucalyptus. So it's those sorts of things, really. I ought, oh, it's ivy. I was just going to say, those are the sorts of things I should be writing in here. And I have. So that's an ivy leaf and that's a eucalyptus. Some of the paper I'm using, I've used for other things and I've got some distress inks and some printing on there from my printer. So that's been quite interesting. But to be honest, I thought, well, it won't matter because it's going to be dyed anyway. I love the different colours that I've got on different days and I'm really liking putting the journal together and writing in a way that's not exactly you know, wonderfully neat and fantastic, but it's a lot better than my usual handwriting. 
So this was day four and onwards, day five. It was quite difficult when I'd got all sorts of different colours on a day. I was choosing the dyes within the same colour family. But on this day, I know that I got mainly darker browns and I've chosen this one as the example. But there you go, I liked it. I love these pinks and I love all the folds as well. This was a day when I went into greens and turquoises and blues and I was trying to get some little imprints on there from some little wooden butterflies and flowers and things like that. And there's a bee there. It didn't work particularly well, but I want to try and improve on that. I want to be able to get some better marks. This was the first time that I tried two colour and that, that I really like because I get different bands of colour within the same colour and then when the two colours overlap I get a different colour and then bands within the second colour as well. This paper I definitely want to do again and to explore much more because I folded the paper and then just dyed the edges and then dyed the middle and it does weaken the paper at the fold and it's a sort of shibori style technique I guess if you're if you know anything about dyeing fabric shibori dyeing of fabric it's a bit like organized tie dye but yeah really think that would be something probably worth doing many dye sessions on that within the hundred days then I went back to the blues and the pinks and the violets and the lavenders. Really enjoyed doing those colours. And for the watercolour paper that I've just shown you, I actually took off some of the uh, serrated bits that I'd torn it out the book from. And I think they look really good. I love that pattern. And having them dyed and on the edge of the page, I think it's really quite effective. I'm going to go through now and I'm going to write my plans and then I'm going to share them with you with some examples. I've just made a quick list on the page of things to go through. The first one is whether to add alcohol inks or gel-like printing with bubble wrap. I did that on a few of the days. This is how the alcohol inks look. They're very vibrant and very discreet spots. I also tried adding some of the bubble wrap and acrylic paint. And yeah, that's, that's alcohol inks and bubble wrap as well. And I think really I can do those effects on any paper. And I think it obscures the hand dyed effects that I'm getting. So I'm going to decide not to do that again in the future. So that is going to be a big no. I also experimented with mica powders and just sprinkled these onto the wet paper using colours that sort of matched in. And you can probably see there is a sort of sheen and a glimmer to the paper. And I really like that. I like it more when there's not much contrast with the mica and the dye colour. And I think that one looks really good. But I didn't mind it when I'd got a lighter mica powder and a really dark dyed background. So mica powders, I'm definitely going to say yes, explore further. Corrugated cardboard, we don't need to even think about that. That is a yes. <laughs> I absolutely love the lines that it produces. And it's really handy when I'm dyeing the paper to have that underneath because as well as adding texture, it also absorbs excess liquid. So it keeps my dye desk tidier. Palm leaves, what's this, palm leaves? Well, I got these at the car boot sale uh, last summer or the summer before and they've been in the garage. I've never known what to use them for. And they basically are whole palm leaves that have been dyed and they come in a big A4 pack. 
and I used those and wet them and ironed them directly onto the paper and I did get the texture but I also got the colour because they're in really deep red that's a particularly good one actually on that paper you get the impression in the paper and you get the colour when I start going back to the car boot sale I'll see if that particular stand is there and if they have any other colours because the whole pack was only a pound so palm leaves is a yes and explore further now because I'd had such success with embossing with leaves I thought I'd try some metal objects I mean obviously I get marks with the iron sometimes and in the beginning I was thinking oh no I've got to try and avoid that but later on I've just started to embrace it because I don't think there's a huge amount of difference I can make because I've got to put the iron on to semi-dry the paper and so I started using the iron to sort of make impressions not keeping it in one place and trying to make these sort of petal designs other metal objects I haven't had a great deal of success with. I haven't really got any metal objects. I've tried coins, they didn't do anything. And I tried a key, and I did get a couple of impressions with the key, but I have to say, I think that was a coin. I have to say, I'm not really enthusiastic. Um, I mean, if I want a picture of a key, I could do some post-production stamping with a key stamp, which would look a lot better. So yeah, I'm not going to really worry about metal objects and embossing or trying to get colour. So metal objects is going to be a no. Wooden objects. I had a little pack of those things like flowers and butterflies that I mentioned. And they didn't really work well either. I tried dipping them in the dye and then sort of sandwiching them between two pieces of paper and ironing that. And occasionally I got quite a good print, but most of the time I just got a smudgy mess. Worse on the other side. And sometimes I did get quite a nice sort of embossed image of one of the flowers. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to see that but it's very faint just around there but I don't think actually it's worth the effort again I can use stamps I can use die cuts I can use all sorts after I've dyed the paper so I think wooden objects definitely is also going to be a no now thinking about colours, are there any colours that I didn't like? Well, I don't particularly like orange and navy blue, I have to say. But otherwise, I don't think there's anything that I've dyed that I haven't liked. I mean, this one is quite dark, as was the one that I used in the masterboard. But I think on ordinary paper... It's just so grungy and this has all sorts of different organic effects and it's sort of blue and brown which I think works really well and there's some interesting creasing as well. So I don't mind dark, I like dark, I like light, I like grungy, I like pastel, I like it all really. So yeah, just keep experimenting I'm going to say. And any colours to avoid? Not really. No. Dye solution concentration. Now this is quite interesting. It's a technical point, I guess, that may only be of interest to me. But I thought I knew my dyes pretty well because I've been using them for the best part of seven years. But dyeing on one medium and dyeing on another medium you can't really translate it so I knew about the concentrations of each of my colors depending on yarn dyeing I knew some were likely to be taken up more some you needed to add more dye to get the color that you wanted and so on with paper it's the same in that some colors are much more vibrant than others 
if you put the same amount of dry dye powder in a solution. So it's not equivalent. An orange is particularly vibrant, whereas a pink that I've got, I probably need to add three times the amount of dye powder to get the same intensity of colour. So dye solution concentration definitely needs more experimenting. Splatters is the next one and this is a good example. I haven't done too many pieces of like this where I've done, I've got some green splatters and then I've got some brown splatters over the top. The green splatters I did in a completely different way but the brown splatters I literally just splattered with the brush. So there are various ways to get a splattered effect and I like, I like the splatters, so I'm going to put yes, do more. Similarly, speckles, where you actually sprinkle the dye powder onto wet paper. I really liked the effect of that. And some of these I added salt to, some I just added the dye powder. And then I've added mica powder as well. So I like those effects. I must admit I didn't like the salt because when I ironed it I was using quite coarse salt. When I ironed it I tended to get holes in the paper. So for speckles I'm going to put yes, do more and salt I'm going to put no. I know you can get some really interesting effects with coffee dyed and tea dyed paper and salt but it depends on the way that you're dyeing. I think with salt you have to put it on wet paper, sprinkle the salt and then let it dry naturally and the salt absorbs the water and takes the water out of the paper so you get all sorts of different marks. Where I'm doing it and I'm ironing the paper and getting it semi-dry so I don't have to hang it everywhere, it's not working so well for me. So I'm going to leave that. In the summer, when it's easier to dry papers and I can leave stuff lying about, then I might try that again and I might try it with dyed paper as well as coffee dyed and tea dyed. I haven't divided this page into sections because I'm not quite sure what sections I'm going to have yet. But this is more of a, a sort of free thinking session and deciding where I'm going to go from here. First of all, though, I want to tell you about some of the different papers that I tried, apart from copy paper and watercolour paper. I've only done one sheet, which is why I didn't mention it before. This is 250 GSM card. I don't like it for many reasons. I mean, I quite like the fact that I've got these, these sort of splatters here and the marks. Ignore the fact that it's got print underneath it because it was a scrap piece of card. And the other side is sort of okay. I don't particularly like the orange. It was too bright. This is the first time that I dyed with the orange and I didn't realise it was going to be so vibrant and in your face. I don't like card. That's the first thing to note. No to heavy card. That leads me on to thinking about, well, what other papers am I going to try? In this particular day, <laughs> I did the orange, I tried some wallpaper. This was left over from one of my desk backgrounds. And yeah, it's interesting. It's orange again. But you can see that the text from the wallpaper and the design from the wallpaper shows through. And actually, the thickness is not too bad. I've tried doing some stenciling on the back just to see how that worked and that did work quite well and I quite like the flexibility of the paper. So no to heavy card, yes to wallpaper. And I'm going to put do more. I also want to go thinner in all sorts of ways. <laughs> But I'm thinking about paper particularly. So I'm thinking about deli paper, 
tissue paper and rice paper not edible rice paper which I've realized I have and it's completely useless but the thin rice paper I haven't actually got any so I'll have to source some but I thought I'd start by trying ordinary tissue paper I like the effect on the 80 GSM ordinary copy paper and I think that will be really great for collage now watercolour paper I did like the watercolour paper and I've already got quite a few sheets. I cannot see myself using huge amounts of it. So I'm going to put watercolour paper restrict quantity because otherwise I'll end up with a lot of it. And unless I have a particular thing in mind that I'm going to use it for, like a journal cover, there's no point in dyeing it up. So that's the paper. That's all I can think of about the paper. I'm not worried about experimenting with colour. I'm going to carry on with that. But these two pieces of paper have made me think of something in that this was a scrap piece of card. It was some yarn labels from my yarn daying days. And that was my Craftanoon Treats yarn logo. And this was the description of the yarn itself. Now, what I thought was interesting from this is that the colours here, that's in colour and that's in colour, the colours have run. They've almost disappeared. You can't even tell what they looked like when the, when the card was in hot water and then ironed. It's just obliterated that design. Whereas when it says Craftanoon Treat Yarns, and particularly where it's got this information about the, the yarn itself for the ball band, that is a teeny weeny bit smudged, but actually you can still read it. Well, obviously, if I put it the right way up, you might be able to still read it. But I thought that was really interesting. And it opens up the possibility of not using card, but using ordinary copy paper and printing a line drawing or something like that in black ink and then over dyeing that, perhaps not with a darker colour like this orange, something less intense, that could actually be quite an interesting effect. So I'm going to put dye pre-printed paper. That, I think, will be a major experiment and that will probably take me three or four dye sessions to really explore what happens with different colours, what happens with different thicknesses of lines, etc. But very exciting. And within that, I could also try a bit more wallpaper. The difficulty with the wallpaper is always the copyright issue. So if I wanted to use some of my hand dyed papers as backgrounds, I wouldn't be able to use that because that is a commercial wallpaper and that is copyrighted. I can use it as collage fodder and I can use it in a journal. There's no problem with that, but I wouldn't be able to copy it in any way. The other thing I really like is the two colour or three colour, the dyeing in bands. So I'm going to add a note and put dye in colour bands as well, because I think that has a huge amount of potential. Looking at this, I also remember what I did here. <laughs> Sometimes I forget. These weren't the wooden flowers. They were the, the paper that I had left after die cutting some flowers. So the negative space is where you can see the flower. And that worked much better than I thought. So that's how I got those images. And I think I will definitely try that again. So I'm going to put use waste from die cuts 
and I can experiment with all sorts of different dyes as well. I can actually make the dyes and cut the thing out that I want. Be interesting to do some leaves as well. And if I do that and then I have a sheet where all the negative space is a leaf shapes, that could work really well. One thing I definitely want to do is explore texture. I love the corrugated cardboard texture, but I want to try some other things. And I was thinking about fabrics, using some heat resistant fabrics. And the one I can think of at the moment is Hessian. I've got some Hessian and I might be able to get some really cool grid-like effects by using a Hessian background to iron the dyed papers. So I'm going to put Hessian there and I'll leave that blank and try and think of some other things. The trouble is when you do this, these sorts of things, I'm now looking around the house and whenever I'm out, I'm looking at things thinking, ooh, could I do something with that? Ooh, could I do something with that? <laughs> So yes, I, I've been looking. I've been eyeing up the blind in my office, thinking, "Hmm, that's quite a nice texture." <laughs> but you know, you've got to you've got to rein yourself in. You've got to keep control of everything. So I think what I've got there is potentially another ten days of dyeing to explore that. And as I said, I want to use some of my dyed papers and make some ephemera for the next maybe five days. So I'm looking at resuming some dyeing around day 16 of this project. But that's what I like about this project. It's flexible and I'm doing it to learn more about dyeing paper. So I think dyeing in sort of 10 day slots and then having a few days to reflect and use the papers and see how they hold up to other treatments, that's all part of the learning process. And I will make much more progress than if I just blindly carry on now and think, right, I've got to do some dying today, I've got to do some dying today. It's not that sort of project. You are in control. Oh, well, I am in control of my project. You are in control of your project. So I'm left with this page. And I think I'm going to leave that blank for the moment. I did like the idea of maybe cutting a very small square of one of each of the papers from each of the days and starting to make a sort of calendar of them all. I'll have to see if I can fit all 100. So I think that might be an idea for that page. But then the page after, I will start and record some of the ephemera I'm making next week. So I'm going to call this day 12. Because that's, that's today. That's when I'm doing the video. And this is day 11, which is when I did my reflecting and planning. Now, the only other thing I wanted to do in this video is very quickly put a cover on my journal. At the moment, it's just plain black. And like I did with the journal that I've made for practicing my hand lettering, I want to make a more interesting cover for this. And I thought something that would be ideal are some of the prints that I made from my masterboard on Thursday. I do have a couple of spare prints and I'm going to cut them to size and show you how this looks.
and that's the finished cover. I hand cut these letters after I printed them out and I actually printed them on the back of my master board, the scan that I did of that. And then I've put the individual letters on at sort of different angles and I've just outlined each one with my black Tombow pen to make them stand out a bit. I've added a few white dots around and that is it. Apart from the spine, which I've done in my best writing to say my 100 day project 2023 art paper joy. And then the back is just the paper plain, nothing fancy and leaving space for the elastic. So that's it for today. Look out for next Thursday's video, which is part two of how I'm using my master board to make tags and journals and other ephemera. And also I've got a journal with me video planned for this Tuesday. So I'll see you soon. Thanks for watching. Bye.